Today's lab was about bacteria and viruses. Now, bacteria and viruses are not closely related to each other. We just put them together in the same lab due to convenience. Bacteria are all prokaryotes, which means that they are missing a membrane-bound nucleus that the eukaryotes have. And viruses are actually not technically alive, but we'll talk about that later. But first, we looked at bacteria, and we looked at the idea that bacteria are pretty much everywhere you look. We've got some agar plates in which we swabbed and we rubbed on different surfaces and rubbed on the agar. We grew them in our incubator. You can see this came off someone's hand. It's a nice bacterial growth on the plate. And this one right here was a swab on the corner by the door in our lab room on the floor. You can see the entire plate's almost completely covered with bacterial growth after being grown for two days in the incubator. Also, bacteria is floating around in the air. And so we have got three plates. We've got a plate of agar that we exposed to the air for 10 minutes and grew. You can see that there are no real colonies growing on that, that plate. We've got one that we exposed to the air for 30 minutes and grew. So we have two nice colonies, fairly large, growing on the plate. Then we exposed to the air for 30 minutes. Looks like we've got um, one big colony, one fuzzy thing. Which could be bacteria or mold, I'm not sure. One very small colony. So generally speaking, the more time exposed to the air, the more colonies you'll see. But that's not always the case. What lands in the plate is also fairly random in nature. Okay, there are three main morphological shapes of bacteria you need to know. They are uh, cocci, which are ball-shaped bacteria. Bacilli, which are rod-shaped bacteria. Spirilla, which are kind of spiral-shaped or thread-shaped bacteria. So you're going to need to be able to recognize all three types if you see them from a photograph. I'm not going to pull a photograph up, photograph up on the video monitor today, but you can find photographs of them up on Blackboard. Okay. The next thing we're going to look at, look at is bacterial anatomy. So here's a diagram of very simple bacteria. You can see it swims with a flagellum, and it's got three layers on its outer surface. It's got an outer capsule a middle cell wall, and the inner layer is the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. Remember, bacteria do not have a nucleus. Instead, their DNA is contained in a region of the cell called the nucleoid. Their DNA is basically circular and it's coiled up inside that nucleoid region, but it's not surrounded by any kind of membrane. Bacteria do not have any membrane-bound organelles except for ribosomes, which, of course, make protein. The interior contents of the cell, which is kind of a jelly-like material, is of course called the, called the cytoplasm like it is in all cells. Okay, so the next thing we did was we made a stain of Bacillus magatarium. If you want to see what Bacillus magatarium looks, up, looks like, make sure you look up the picture on blackboard of Bacillus magatarium. And then we looked at cyanobacteria. And I've got two kinds of cyanobacteria pulled up on the video monitor. Let's go take a look. Okay, so cyanobacteria are prokaryotes, which means, like the bacteria, they are lacking in the membrane-bound nucleus. So they're similar to bacteria in that regard, but these are photosynthetic and they're filamentous in organization. So they form long chains of cells. And they're green in color because they have chloroplasts that capture light energy to make their food. So here's a cyanobacteria called anabina. So you need to make sure you can recognize the anabina and recognize a very special cell type it has. And that is the heterocyst. The anabina basically looks like a long chain of pearls. And some of the cells on that chain are lighter in color and larger. Those are the heterocysts. Heterocysts are very important because the anabina uses them for nitrogen fixation. That's when the anabina will take nitrogen out of the water that surrounds it and make it available for the rest of the anabina cells to use. And the anabina uses the nitrogen to do things like make proteins or nucleotides. So make sure you recognize the anabina. Make sure you can recognize the heterocyst and know what the heterocyst does. Let's take a look at our next one, the oscillatoria. Oscillatorium. 
look at this. This is excellent. This is oscillatory, and look, our oscillatory is moving. It's waving back and forth. So that's where oscillatory gets its name, from the fact that some strands of oscillatory will oscillate back and forth. So that's a very distinctive feature of oscillatory. Oscillatory is just another uh, cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. It's a protist, or excuse me, not cytoprotist, it's a prokaryotic photosynthetic organism. So make sure you can recognize the oscillatory and know that oscillatory may be able to move. Okay. So another fun fact about cyanobacteria is that some of the oldest known fossils in the world are of cyanobacteria. They are and these cyanobacteria have formed algal stromatolites. Here's a picture of an algal stromatolite. Basically, it's a where the cyanobacteria form mats and they trap minerals, and they basically form rocks. Algal stromatolites are very common in early fossil records. Like I told you before, they're some of the world's oldest fossils. And though they used to be common in the past, actually they're fairly rare now. There's only a few places in the world now where how those traumatolites are still being formed today. Okay, from here we switched over um, pretty much completely differently and we started talking about viruses. So let's walk on over and take a look at some virus models and talk about viruses. Like I said earlier, viruses are not prokaryotic because they're not even alive. But they do have some similarities to living organisms. Viruses are not made out of cells like living organisms. They don't have any kind of metabolism, so they don't need to eat food in order to get energy. Also, they do not respond to stimuli. They can reproduce. However, they cannot reproduce by themselves. They have to parasitize a living cell in order to reproduce. Usually what viruses will do Will be they will attack a living cell, genetic, inject their genetic material into the cell, and that genetic material will hijack the host cell's DNA and force that host cell to manufacture new copies of the virus. Eventually, those viruses will rupture the cell. Rupturing the cell is called lysing it, and they'll spread out and attack other nearby cells. So they're not alive, but they're parasites of living cells. Here's a model of a tobacco mosaic virus. It's very simple. Genetic material is RNA. So it's got an RNA core here surrounded by a protein coat called uh, the capsid. And this entire protein coat, the capsid, is made of individual units called capsomeres. So the big capsid is made of lots of little capsomeres. And it protects the RNA core. The next kind of virus we looked at was the bacterial phage. So let's look at bacterial phage. Here's a simple model of a bacteriophage. See, it's got a head, it's got a sheath, it's got tail fibers. So bacteriophages specialize in parasitizing bacteria. So bacteriophage will land on a bacteria, inject its genetic material, and force that bacteria to make new copies of the bacteriophage. It will eventually lyse the cell and go and attack the bacteria. We looked at an experiment involving bacteriophages, which I'm going to discuss with you. Basically, bacteriophages, or different types of bacteriophages rather, are specific for attacking particular kinds of bacteria. One kind of bacteriophage cannot necessarily attack all kinds of bacteria. So we looked at some four tubes of nutrient broth, similar to the agar, and that is a substance for growing bacteria. And we looked at two control tubes, one of E. coli, one of Prose vulgaris. Now, you hold these up to light, take a look at them, you can see that they're both kind of cloudy. Cloudy cultures contain large quantities of bacteria floating in them. So cloudy means it has a healthy concentration of bacteria. If, the bac if this tube becomes clear, it becomes clear because all the bacteria have died or been killed by the virus. So starting off, the coli and the principal air tubes are both cloudy. So they have healthy concentrations of bacteria. Next, we looked at two more tubes. We looked at two experimental tubes. 
One is E. coli with the bacteriophage, and one is Protus vulgaris with that same kind of bacteriophage added. If you hold it to the light, you can see that E. coli with the phage, this tube is now clear. And Protus vulgaris with the phage, however, it's still cloudy. So Protus vulgaris remains cloudy, even though it has a phage. That means the phage is unable to attack that bacterium because it's not specific for it. However, the E. coli cells have all been killed. You can tell that because the tube's now clear. That means this particular kind of bacteriophage only attacks the E. coli and not the Protus vulgaris. So let's take a look at the HIV virus. Okay, we've got a model of HIV virus. As you probably know, HIV virus attacks immune cells. And so let's talk about the different parts of the HIV virus. On the exterior surface of it, all these ball-like structures are the glycoproteins. Glycoproteins serve to help the virus penetrate the host cell. It's got the protein coder that caps it inside, this, this pinkish structure. Its genetic material is RNA right here. And it has a lipid bilayer here, though that's not apparent on the model. So the lipid bilayer is about here. Now associated with the RNA, it's got some enzymes called reverse transcriptase. Now our primary genetic material is DNA. The HIV has RNA. So when it wants to inject this genetic material in our cells, it uses its reverse transcriptase to make a DNA copy of its RNA, and it can inject that DNA copy into our cells to attack our cells, or rather attack our immune cells. Okay, so that's it for our lab. Make certain that you can identify all the slides, cells, megatherium, anabina, oscillatoria, and other parts. Make sure you can identify the virus models and identify their parts too. Make sure you understand this little experiment with the E. coli and bacillus megatera, excuse me, the E. coli, the Protus vulgaris, being attacked by the bacteriophages. Um, and know the parts of bacterial anatomy and can distinguish the three primary shapes of bacteria you have, among the other things we discussed in the